Well, hello everyone. This is Jason Cisco, and we're coming to you live from the Church Triumphant in our studios here at 1030 Strawberry Road in Pasadena, Texas. Welcome to another edition of Prayer Nation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for your feedback. Whenever we see you at one of the World Network of Prayer Conferences, just like I was in Summers of Sacrifice in St. Louis, it's a biannual uh, international conference that we uh, promote through our organization. It's always just so encouraging to hear that people are connecting with us and are a part of Prayer Nation. We are the tip of the spear. We are an advanced intercessory group of people that are moving the kingdom of God forward one day at a time, one prayer at a time. And we are assaulting strongholds. We are tearing down these imaginations. We are bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We are learning self-mastery and then we are learning how to release dominion into the world again and take our rightful place as sons of God operating in the earth. This is our position, this is our purpose, and this is our privilege. We are carriers of the presence of God, and what a delight it is to know that there are so many of you that take your walk with God so seriously and are walking with that wisdom of God that you are walking in that clarity of the Spirit. This is what we are deeply coveting after, is that we can see circumspectly, that we can understand not just the times, but also understand what is the will of God for that time. It is our desire that all of the things that God has made available to us as grace increases in these last days, that we will be able to not just know that it's there, have an awareness of those resources, but be fully furnished ourselves, accessing them for ourselves, and having the confidence that we can do that, and then adding one more layer, knowing that there are others that are also operating in these same dimensions, with the same understanding, and working for the same goal. So thank you, Prayer Nation. We are making a difference together because of our agreement so I want to, again, just bring us into that place of clarity in ourselves that comes when we just submit it all to God. There is a subtlety that is in the world today, and that's why the epistle that Peter wrote, 1 Peter chapter 5, says, Be sober and be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So he's looking for someone to give him permission, not whom he can, but whom he may. If he could do it, he would have already done it. So he's trying to find a way for you and I to let him in through intimidation, through subtlety, through various forms of intimidation and accusation. The adversary is trying to push a door open so that we will uh, let him in. So we have to be sober and vigilant. We have to be aware of the subtleties and sometimes the very overt, not just the covert, but overt strategies of hell to try to shut down the very kingdom of God. So that means it starts with us. It starts with you and I making these commitments, reaffirming our faith, reigniting the fire that we have in our soul to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, to please him in everything that we do, to let the glory of the Lord continue to just lead and guide us and get closer and closer and more manifest in our services as well as in our daily lives. So for us to have influence as a church, for us to have influence as a movement, we must first learn how to maximize our own position in the spirit. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about overcoming uh, complacency and why sometimes we become complacent and adjusting um, our, our focus and our uh, getting a little more clarity on that. We're also going to come in and talk a little bit more about the mindsets for our motivation. In order to have a long-term sustained growth or development or to continue be perfected, uh, for you to 
have long-term um, fruitfulness in the kingdom of God, not just years, but maybe decades? Um, how, how do you do that? A lifetime of effectiveness? How do you, how do you manage the, the urgency uh, that's constantly put on your plate versus uh, keeping your passion strong? So we're going to talk about that today, and uh, we're going to let the Holy Spirit lead us. I have a feeling that there's going to be uh, some demonstration of the Spirit today, so be prepared. I'm feeling the Holy Ghost already, strong current that's just building. I think you're probably already feeling it today. Let's lift our hands. Let's lift our voices. Let's come together in prayer together right now, giving you a few minutes for all of my Prayer Nation live uh, folks to get connected with us, and we're so glad that you're here. Thank you for coming wherever you're connecting from, all across the United States, all around the world. Uh, we are so blessed to have a international presence here online every time we do a live broadcast. So let's pray together. I want you to just open up your hands like this. And what you're doing when you open your hands is you're basically just releasing. So it goes both directions. I'm releasing this direction out. I'm releasing everything that is negative. I'm, I'm lifting out. I'm, I'm having, I'm praying for God to lift out all of the, the, the dirt and the scum and the corruption that's in the world that kind of sticks to us, that gets into our souls. Sometimes, uh, we want to just release all of that all of the various ministry things that we're involved with or prayers that we're praying about, sticky situations, uh, sinful situations, disappointing situations, painful situations. We've had a lot of deaths in this last uh, few days, tragedies. People are wondering about that. There's a lot of grief that is out there, a lot of loss. We lost one of our uh, one of our best uh, this week uh, and uh, Church Triumphant. We feel that 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 pain when you lose someone that you love and that has been such a vital part of your church family. There's a lot of these things. So our first prayers are prayers of release, and then the hands are open so that we can receive. So let's start together. Would you do that? We're going to start with a thanks, Father. We thank you that you are with us through the ebb and the flow, just as you created the tide, just as you have the seasons, just as the sun comes up and the sun goes down, as we feel the heat of the day and then the cool of the day. Father, we thank you that there are rhythms. Our body is in rhythm. Our lives can be in rhythm. You can help us, Lord Jesus, to know how to be reset, renewed. You said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So Lord, we want our minds to be renewed today. And we ask you, Lord, in Jesus name right now, we just want to release all of the things that are negative, all of those internal voices that say we can't, that we're not good enough, that we're unworthy, that we're too inconsistent, that we are uh, a failure in some way. God, we silence those voices right now. We, we silence that accuser. We silence that internal negativity. And we pray that the power of the Holy Spirit right now will just flow through these cameras. It will flow through social media right now. It will come to whatever phone or iPad or screen that people are watching or listening to right now, that, that that voice of God will override. We cut off the voice of the enemy in Jesus' name. And we pray that we would hear the truth, that we would hear, yes, we need to be saved. Yes, we need to be transformed. Yes, there's areas of growth that need to happen. Yes, we need to be more like you. Jesus, but we thank you that you love us just as we are right now, that you love us with perfect love, that you have good thoughts for us, you have good plans for us, that you have a desire for us to succeed and not to fail, that we are blessed and not cursed, that we are the head and not the tail, in Jesus' name. So I thank you, Father, and I release every bit of negativity. Now we're gonna do it by categories. Father, right now, first, by just the temporal things, we release any negativity around finance, disappointment around jobs, disappointment around uh, bills, disappointment around responsibilities, repairs that need to be made, all these things that we carry around as cares of life. God, we cast all of our cares upon you about our cars, our houses, our jobs, oh God, our responsibilities financially, and our desire, oh God, to be in a better position 
situation so that we not only need a blessing, but Lord Jesus, we can move into that position of being a blessing, that we will be a blessing to others for it's more blessed to give than to receive because if we are givers, it means that we're operating in an overflow. So we pray that you bless the gift, that you would bless the tithe, that you would bless, oh God, our sacrificial offerings, that you would bless, oh God, our other finances by putting you first as we put you first lord we are we are giving in private but we are rewarded openly and so we confess in jesus name we re place this negative feeling of of always uh, treading water or even getting behind and we replace that by saying in jesus name i seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be added my god shall supply all of my needs all of your needs according to his riches and glory we thank you father that there is a wealth transfer that is happening for the body of Christ so that we can do your will, not so that we can uh, live uh, according to our flesh, but Lord, so that we can live the freedom that you want us to live in, where we are free from debt and free from worry, and we are able to facilitate your kingdom in an awesome way, where we are not serving money, but money is serving you. So we thank you, Father, oh God, for all these things. We release them to you, and we receive a blessing in our finance. We receive open doors and opportunities. We receive, oh God, wisdom and insight. We receive faith to go to the next level. We receive, oh God, an understanding of how to break through some of the mindsets that are limiting in Jesus' name. Now for relationships and emotions, let's release these things to God. Father, we give you, Lord Jesus, all the complicated nuances of our homes whether it's wives and uh, our husbands, whether it's marriage, oh God, whether we're overcoming maybe a divorce or someone has lost a spouse to, to a disease, or maybe there is someone sick in that home. Father, we come to you right now for the stress that can be upon marriage and can be upon family. God, we pray in the name of Jesus and we give this to you and we pray for toxicity in our emotions around these highly personal, oh God, uh, relationships that we have. We give these to you. We pray, oh God, right now for our spouses. We pray right now for those that, that we are in committed relationship with right now. We pray that these covenants before you would be strengthened. Help our passion to be strong with husbands and wives. God, renew the love within our families, oh God, and let it start with our marriages. We pray in the name of Jesus that, that all of the enemies sabotage, all of the things that would, that would create perversity or distraction or maybe there are gaps or there are feelings, Lord Jesus, of, of needs not being met and the enemy is trying to bring temptation. God, we break the power of the adversary trying to draw away spouses or to destroy marriages. And we pray in Jesus' name, especially for our ministry families, God, that carry so many weights of, of burdens upon them and how they carry that with them into their homes and into their private worlds. We are praying a release in Jesus' name of all the anxiety anxiety and the burdens and all the complications of dealing with sinful people and trying to help them and how that can sometimes uh, taint our minds. We pray that we would be renewed today. We would be refreshed today that the power of the Holy Ghost would just come in in Jesus name and touch our marriages. For all of our singles that are out there, we pray for the frustrations of not having made that connection yet, that haven't found that spouse that they're looking for yet, that they still have hopes and dreams for finding that soul that would go with the, through the rest of their life together with them in ministry and, and in purpose and in fulfillment. God, we pray that you'd bring the right people together, that you would help them to meet and go, be across the right, uh, right pathways. Father, we break up, oh God, all those relationships that are not supposed to be together. God, we bind, Lord Jesus, every device of Satan to make people unequally yoked. We pray in the name of Jesus that you would bring together power couples for your name for these last days. People that are pure, that are righteous, that are passionate, that have a desire for the things of God, but that you would give them that grace of life, oh God, to make a difference as a couple. Help those who are supposed to have the ministry of singleness that are, that are not ever going to get married. God, I pray that you would give them the peace and the grace for that. And you'd help them to be like the Apostle Paul, to be like Phoebe, to be like so many who have 
poured out their lives for the things of God and have been such huge, powerful forces for good because they gave their singleness to God. We pray your blessings upon them. And now for our children, Lord Jesus, today, we pray a blessing upon our children. We pray that you would break, oh God, every device of Satan to program our kids, oh God, to think a certain way, to act a certain way, to dress a certain way. Oh God, we break the influence of music and media. Oh God, we pray in the name of Jesus for our kids. I want you to just open your hand right now and I want you to imagine that the names of your kids are written in your hands right now if you have children. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, you wrote our names in your palms, oh God. And so we, this is how we feel about our kids. And now we ask you, Lord, to take them from our hands to your hands. Oh God, work in their lives. Let not the enemy's patterns, oh God, for them or, or, or plans for them work. Let them be disrupted. But we pray instead that they would fall into the perfect plan that you have for their life, the perfect will of God, and that you would raise up a generation right now for signs and wonders and miracles in Jesus' name for the advancement of your kingdom. Our emotions around our coworkers, our emotions around extended family members, emotional relationships. God, help us to be healthy in our relationships, oh God. Started in our homes, and as it flows out, oh God, into every other space, whether it's work or public space, where we're interacting with others, oh God, or whether it is in our churches. God, we are asking you, Lord Jesus, that you would help us in our emotions, in our thoughts, oh God, today. We have already talked about our negative thoughts and we've given them to you. And we ask you, God, that we would have the mind of Christ. Give us a miracle mind. Give us, oh God, divinely inspired thoughts, divinely inspired intent or motive. Give us divinely inspired, oh God, dreams and visions. Help us, oh God, to be naturally in sync with you. And so we give ourselves to you spirit and soul and body in Jesus' name. We give our health to you. Oh God, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, for all the ways that you bless us in ourselves, in Jesus' name. And through us, you are letting your light shine. All right, now, let's uh, take the, the whole armor of God on together. Let's pray that together. We take our loins, get about with truth. We take our breastplate of righteousness. We take our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We take the shield of faith. Take the helmet of salvation. We take the sword of the spirit, which is the rhema word of God. I want to talk to you now a little bit about complacency. Many years ago, we did a drama at our church and it was, I think, so, I think it was called The Soul. I think that's what they called it, but it was about complacency. It was so powerful. I was thinking about it the other day, even though I was a little kid when I, when I was there uh, at our church there and our church performed it, I wasn't in it, but I, I saw it night after night because my dad was the pastor. So we were there every night of the drama. There was um, a picture of a man um, and uh, a story of a man that um, was in church at, and was was doing was doing right and was living for God, and then um, he was slowly allowing other things to creep in. And so there was a man standing next to him that was dressed in all white, who represented his soul. And every time he would make a bad decision, the man would freeze, but the soul then would become animated. And in the back, you would hear doom, 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 doom. Doom, 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 and in the back, here would come a demon. And of course, this was someone playing a role, and but he would have a he would have a can of tar, and the demon would come in, and he would walk in. He would see the soul all dressed in white, and he would take that hand, and he would wipe that big streak of black, that tar all over his clothes and the soul would just ah like this and then he would just kind of walk off to that music the music would stop and then the man would go from his freeze position and he would kind of look around for a second and then it was like oh it was just a beer i just drank one beer it's not a big deal it was little things that he was doing and slowly drifting away, not praying, not going to church. And then each time he would make a choice like this through the drama, 
that hand would come in and swipe him until there were just swipes all over it. And we started, re oh, the, the audience would start as soon as the music would start. Oh, we would start groaning because here he comes again and you could feel it. And the design that it was designed on purpose to create an angst in you that this can't happen to me. Well, the final scene, the soul uh, uh, is now captured. The music changes uh, and it's now and uh, now uh, the, 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 the demon comes in and chains him and wraps him all up and then throws him in a prison. And he slams the door and then he turns around and he, and he folds his arms and then he bows to the audience. <laughs> yes, I have won. Yes, I have won. Yes. <laughs> and he bows like, congratulate me in my victory. And of course, it's sarcastic and it's sinister and it's repulsive. And the demon, uh, the demon makes a small speech right there. And it's, it's riveting and dark and, and intense. And then um, the soul starts crying out and I think his name I think uh, the the man the main man was Philip 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 this is your soul this is your soul Philip I'm crying out to you Philip <laughs> I'm in pain you've neglected your your walk with God I'm in prison I'm not happy things are not the way they're supposed to be I shouldn't feel this way Philip Philip, this is your soul crying out. You need to reach out to God again. I'm in prison. I'm bound. And he just starts yelling out like this. And all of a sudden, Philip gets up and he goes, what am I doing? What am I doing? I can't believe this. And he falls on his face and he starts to worship and he starts repenting. He says, oh God. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I don't know what I've been doing, God. And then the demon goes, no, 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 you can't do that. No, stop it, stop it. Oh God, no God, I gotta get back. I gotta go back, I gotta get back to my prayer. I gotta get, and all of a sudden an angel comes in the back door. And I'll tell you, the music starts to change. And it's just, and it was like, oh my God, what's going on now? And, and you didn't see him at first. And all of a sudden the angel comes in with a sword and he points at the demon and he goes, you go now. And man, that's, that man goes, Aah! and he goes running out the door. And when he runs out the door, the, the angel hits the, the, the gate and the soul and um, it's, it's really awesome. I'm not sure, I can't remember how they did it, but um, his, his blackened uh, outer garments turned white and we pulled him out and uh, he's standing next to Philip and now the soul has his hand raised like Philip has his hand raised and there's this beautiful worship music that starts playing in the background. And I mean, tears are coming down the face and the angel is standing there holding up his hands. And I mean, it's like, it's altar time. And it would be night after night after night, people were just flooding to the altars because you could see the beautiful drama depiction of how easily we can slowly slip into complacency. I wanted to just say this at the, at the beginning of summer here is that this is a time when we can so easily be distracted. We can be so easily just kind of forget about what's going on in the world. And I'm not wanting to take away your vacation, but I can tell you what the Lord said to me, never take a vacation from my presence. It's okay to take a vacation from your responsibilities 
at church. Maybe you need to take a week with your family and go somewhere. Somebody else serves upstairs in the kids' ministry, or somebody else does the youth, or somebody else sings in the choir or the praise team. Somebody else is an usher this week. Somebody else gives the Bible lesson. Hey, that's great. Someone else leads the prayer team. Whatever it is that you do, um, someone else you know, I don't know, does some of the admin behind the scenes, maybe you're a volunteer uh, during the week. It's okay to take a break from your church work, but we never take a break from the presence of God because in the presence of God is where our burdens are lifted. In the presence of God is where we are renewed. There's a difference between entertainment and recreation. There's a difference. When you are operating in entertainment, you are pretty much escaping, but you are escaping through, uh, and not all entertainment is carnal or bad, but it tends to be something that feeds your flesh. It tends to be something that doesn't feed your soul. It tends to be something that uh, helps break your concentration on the negative things, and it kind of gives you something to laugh at or to be uh, inspired by or to be motivated by, wow, gets, get the bad guys or whatever, but that's entertainment. Recreation, recreation is something else. When you are uh, getting out in nature or when you are doing a hike up in a mountain or you are uh, getting away from the technology, when you are allowing yourself some space for private reflection or you are doing things that get you reconnected to your purpose, um, and it's a restful season for you, something that you do that really rests you. You can recreate, recreate. This is something that truly restores your spirit. What Sabbath is supposed to be is supposed to be a time where you dedicate your focus one day a week to just your relationship with God to get all of your, your virtue back, to get all of your uh, reserves restored, to reset your mind, reset the way you think to help you so that you do not burn yourself out. There is a, a principle, and I've talked about it a lot, the principle of virtue, and we've also used the example of 1 Samuel 14, where there was honey uh, that was uh, dripping in the forest when the battle turned and Saul didn't let them eat the honey, and instead, at the end of the day, they ended up eating uh, the animals that they were allowed, by the, after the battle was over, they were allowed to eat, and they were so hungry that, and so exhausted that they ate with the blood. They were not supposed to eat animals with the blood, they were supposed to let the blood drain out, but they actually end up sinning. And so what you learn from that principle is that if you don't take the time to refresh when God is giving you honey, then you'll end up doing something carnal or fleshly that you might actually damage your spiritual relationship with God. So if you don't take those moments, and Saul was like, no, we can't, we can't take a break, we gotta keep going. And sometimes I think as intercessors in spiritual warfare, and sometimes uh, we have to have those moments where we, where we stop and taste the honey. Doesn't mean the battle is over, but the battle can shift in those times because we get renewed. So I'm not talking about I'm not talking about taking a break in order to be renewed. I think there has to be rhythms for that. But I think that if you are if you are just in the grind and you are not hearing God well, complacency can slowly creep in where you just don't give the attention that you should. And this is something that I believe that God wants us to be mindful of. And I'm not talking about it just in your personal prayer life, even though that's usually where it starts. I'm talking about complacency around what's happening in the world. Let's take this to the next level now. So we have heard the ongoing, like say in America, the ongoing um, lawfare that's going on with Donald Trump. Every type of lawsuit that we can have is being thrown at him. And he's constantly talking about it. And there's a point where you just turn it off because you're just tired of hearing it. I just don't want to hear anymore. I know what's going on. I know it's going to keep going on. And then, you know, 
that that's news from the campaign trail and their speeches. And am I engaged with that or am I not engaged with that? And some people are truly fired up by that. And a lot of people, it's, it's summertime. I don't want to think about elections. I don't want to think about who's coming into office. It's probably not going to be much different either way. Uh, they're both, you know, it's the lesser of two evils, you know, (sighs) Um, And then we have this other side with President Biden, who he's been in this feeble state for four years, is sort of the head is sort of reflecting the body. The, The leadership is sort of kind of getting us into this, just let things flow and let's not worry about it. And you know what? You know, America is still America. And Joe Biden, well, we know he's sleepy, Joe, just who cares? That feeling of complacency that it's inevitable, we can't do anything about it. I remember uh, when I was in Brazil, I want to say it was 12 years ago. Uh, It was at least eight years ago, but it may have been 12 years ago. Uh, It was eight years ago. I'm trying to remember which cycle it was. It seemed that the candidate uh, that was coming, that was got the nomination, um, that was coming into office was just going to landslide and come against. And, and I knew that um, if Hillary Clinton got in office at that point, I knew that she felt that the church was her enemy and that um, Christians were her enemy. And I feared that she would go into revenge politics and start going after a 501c3s and all of these things. And I had had people tell me some of this that, um, you know, there, there was a lot of anger there. And I just said, God, if this is good for the church, if this will help us wake up, if the persecution is what's needed, you know, like, okay, you know, uh, should I be bracing ourselves for this? Should I just accept this? Or can I do something about it? Or should, should I pray something different? And the Lord spoke to me, it was two o'clock in the morning. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you can do something about it. And so I then began to pray about this situation. I'm not, I'm not uh, wanting to get into any type of um, hate speech. I'm, this is not what I'm talking about today. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm against policies uh, more than I am uh, particular candidates, but I also know that there's a temperament that sometimes people have and a propensity towards certain things. And that's the reason why I brought that up. And um, there are no perfect presidents. There are no perfect candidates. The left and the right can both bring about antichrist systems. And I've talked about that before. The just strategy just changes, depends on who is in office. But we do have a responsibility. My point is we have a responsibility to pray for those who are in authority. We have a responsibility to pray for righteous people to rule. We have a responsibility to pray about who gets into office and who does not get into office. So I want to show you that we can be very complacent sometimes as the church, and that's exactly what the devil wants. He does not want us to pray about authority. He does not want us to pray about who is in leadership. He does not want us to pray about politics. He does not want us to be involved. He wants us to just sit on the sideline and say, you're in the spiritual part of the world. Just stay there while all the other people that are doing witchcraft or spiritual things on the demonic side, they're free to say and do whatever they want. You know, it's, it's like when I went and talked to my daughter, when she went to a public school, she went to her first year middle school, uh, they were giving her choices of books to read, and she was 11. And uh, Hunger Games was one of the books. So uh, that's what she brought home. We opened it up and looked at it. Well, the movie is one thing, the book is something else. And I, they said, well, it only has a PG, you know, rating on the movie. It shouldn't be that bad. Well, yeah, well, I'm going to review that. You know, she's not watching the movie. But let me look at this book. Well, the book was far worse. And there were so many things in there. Oh, my goodness, his body slipped down into the, into the, you know, to the tent where the girl was and describing a sex scene in the book. And I'm like, oh my goodness, she's 11. So I go into the school and I'm like, this is not okay. And the other choices were like Harry Potter. And I'm like, okay, do you know Harry Potter is witchcraft? And I know it's fun and sweet, but it's written by a witch. Did you know that? This is a religion. 
Witchcraft is a religion. I said, now, is it okay for us to have a Bible in our library here? No, sorry, cannot have a Bible in the library. I said, all right, then take all the Harry Potter out because that's their Bible. We can't have spirit, we cannot have Christian books in our in our bio, in our store but in our library here at the school but it's okay for there to be witchcraft books. And you know what the assistant principal said? Well, this is what they're reading, so this is what they want, so we just want them to read. That's how they learn to read is to have books that will interest them. So, I'm sorry. So this is what you have to understand. This is the complacency. This is the, this is the issue. Oh, well, well, this is what they want. So give them what they want. Be careful what you want. You may get it. Be careful what your flesh wants. Be careful in, in your indulgences. Be careful. It, it can very easily lead you. The Bible talks about the motions of sin. In other words, you start in a direction and then sin keeps carrying you far beyond what you ever thought you would do or far beyond where you ever thought you would go. So complacency in the way culture works is that it's the path of least resistance. This is why we have to be intentional that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we also must understand the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. He reproves the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So it is through that power of truth, the spirit of truth working in us that keeps Keeps us focused and helps us understand this morose, this this sloppy feeling that just kind of uh, just kind of carries us just by inertia towards things of the flesh and that are carnal because that's what's in the world. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So I'm speaking today just from a heart of love for you and for a, a desire that the church would stay focused on our relationship with God, that we are not seasonal Christians, we are not Sunday-only Christians, we are not CFOs we are, or CEOs, we're, we're Christmas, Easter-only <laughs> Christians. We tell lots of stories about that. But that we are, uh, we are standing up, we are... We are standing in that gap. We are interceding and that we can allow the Holy Spirit to help us to make a difference, that we can determine outcomes. Some of the prayers that we pray together on high levels. I was just uh, in the United Nations. We were there praying in the United Nations. What are we doing there? What's happening there? We are praying for the direction of the global community. That's what we're praying for. So we pray for people that are in high places that God will have his will done. Uh, that's just one example. And in those prayer meetings, God meets with us and he speaks to us and he gives us clarity and he helps us to understand strategies and see how the enemy is working. And we, we make the effort, we make the sacrifice, we get into those environments and we're severely fought in the spirit world, but the angels are there and God is working with us and the Holy Spirit anoints. This is why we go and this is why we do it. We need to be like this in our communities in the same way intentional to pray about your mayor pray about your city council pray about your school boards pray about who is leading your city who is leading your region who is representing you who is your senator your congressperson if you're international who is in your parliament who are the who is the family that is leading who are the who are the people that are in charge pray for them that are in authority so let's look at what the scripture says in first timothy 2 in 1 Timothy 2, uh, he, this is just a reminder. We are to pray for kings and for all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And the reason is, verse 4, for who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth in Jesus' name. So let's take a moment and let's pray that God will give us direction, clear direction of how to pray for people that are around us. I think it would be a great exercise for you who are advanced intercessors to do some research, write some names down, 
write down the names of people that are immediately influential in your community, your police chief, your fire chief. Um, think about people that are making policy, the policymakers in your city, uh, whoever they may be, your mayors, your, your, your aldermen's. Think about who they are, find out who they are, write their name down and decide. Maybe it's just once a week you do it, but have a reference point where you are praying for them. If there's an upcoming election, pray about that election. Pray for God's will to be done. Pray that we can live a quiet and peaceable life. If you're seeing uh, uh, maybe a, a, a power struggle or a power vacuum somewhere, it needs to be that the church steps into those leadership vacuums. The Lord showed me about this. This is something that we're praying a lot about. The church must step into its God-ordained leadership role and work alongside established governmental systems because the powers that be are ordained of God. So we are to pray for them. Let's lift our hands, let's lift our voice, and let's pray together. Father. We are asking you for our international leaders, our national leaders, our regional leaders, oh God, our, our, our community leaders. We're praying right now for all who are in authority that you would help us as your people, first of all, to have favor and to have good relationship, healthy relationship with authority, wherever it is, even those who would be our enemies, even those who do not agree with us, or even those whose policies would be very opposite of your word. Give us favor with them. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be able to navigate the leadership, oh God, that you give to us to make an influence uh, in our communities for good, to make a positive impact so that your name may be glorified and so that we can be seen, oh God, in our communities as a place to run to, as a safe place where there are good people, where there are loving people, where there are pastors and ministers and saints that will uh, be compassionate and generous and insightful. God, I pray in Jesus' name, raise up people in the international community. Raise up international prophets and apostles. Raise up, oh God, national prophets and apostles that can give direction and that will speak, oh God, to those in high places. We are praying in Jesus' name that you would bring into office every person that you want for your glory and for your name in Jesus' name. All right, let's clap our hands to the Lord. Let's give him praise in Jesus' name. Now our last segment, urgency versus passion. So this is, I think, something that we have to manage. There are certain things that are not going to change. They're, 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 and so there, we call them tensions that you manage. So for example, in a Sunday service, we have a, a, a tremendous kids ministry upstairs. We all have 100 uh, kids upstairs and maybe 15 to 20 uh, that are serving them or ministering to them uh, in, a, in a Sunday. So it's a whole, a whole ecosystem that's going on upstairs where they're having their own kids service and then they have breakout into classrooms. And we try to do this for the entire service for our guests that are coming in. So their kid can have a great experience, wants to come back to church, and then the parent can have an opportunity to respond to the word. Now we have some services where the power of God falls, our altar services are long, and we've had it where there would be an hour, an hour altar service. Wow, well, you know, what do you do? Do you um, extend your, your uh, volunteers every week, um, or do you try to just shorten your services? Well. We don't want to stop the move of God, but we don't want to burn out our volunteers. We don't want our kids to get frustrated. What do we do? So it's a tension that you have to manage, that every week it ebbs and flows. We had one service. Uh, we had a, a guest a missionary evangelist with us. It went, I, I don't know, till 1.30. We started at 11, went till 1.30. The next week, I, I was um, finishing my message at 12.25, and uh, I called for the musicians, and they thought that, I was saying that as a part of my message. And I was like, I need the musicians to come. And they thought that because I was talking about a choir and in, in Second Chronicles 20 where the choir went out, that I was saying that uh, I was speaking as the king saying, let's call for the musicians. When I was actually saying, no, I'm 
ready for the message to end. And they were, they were actually upstairs. We didn't even serve the snack yet. Oh my goodness, pastor, he can't really be done. He's only preached 30 minutes, you know? And people were just scrambling all over the place. Someone that doesn't normally get on the keyboard had to jump up there and, and they were like, oh my goodness, pastor. I said, no, I mean, I, I would really like the musicians to come and they were scrambling, running up there. It, it, these are things you just have to manage. So we had to talk about after service. I should maybe be a little more intentional about when I was going to end because the, the time was so drastic between services because that's how the move of God was. So there are times when uh, we just have to manage things. And this is how it is with urgency. There are some things that are urgent. That they are urgent and they are important. They're quadrant one, urgent and important. You cannot get away from them. So if I have someone in the hospital, for example, he was in the hospital for 12 days. That was something that got a lot of our time because we needed to be there for that family. This was very urgent. It was very important. It was crucial that the pastoral team was there. I was there several times. Several of our staff members were there. Many of the church members were going up there and praying because it was so, it, it, this is a family that we love, that we care so much about, and they have invested in so many other people's lives and have been so ministry-minded. So now it's urgent. So there's certain things like this that you cannot escape. They're always going to be there, and we just have to manage them. How do we manage the, the complexity of more and more crisis going on in the world, more and more urgency? In other words, uh, what I'm trying to get to is that sometimes there is a tendency towards trying to hype people to get them to that level of high energy, to have this, the kind of response that urgency creates, that creates a legitimate uh, pouring out that we are gladly and legitimately investing into something that has great meaning and value. Whereas every service is important, but sometimes we want people to give that effort. We want them to be, re we really want them to, you know, come on, we want the service to be great. And it seems like that sometimes we're, you know, we're cheerleaders. Come on, everybody, let's clap our hands. You know, come on, well, clap your hands, clap your hands. Woo, Jesus, woo, Jesus, go, 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 Jesus. It's like, everyone's like, okay, look, I've already heard this before. I've heard this song before. You know, I'm tired, and I know you're super excited, and we're excited that you're excited, but I'm not excited just because you're excited. <laughs> and so we we kind of can lack the, the urgency. We can lack the... And, and the same thing can happen around prayer. It can say they can happen around anything that we do for God. And so there's this, how do we, how do you stay on that level? And then you'll see people that have served for decades. You'll hear them preach. You'll hear them pray. You'll see the way that they lead. And I mean, it is like they are a fire every time you hear them. I can't remember one time I heard Lee Stone King. Even when he was, as he would say, stupid tired. He said, Jason, I'm stupid tired. I just got off a plane. I'm stupid tired. Even when he was in one of those cases, the tears are pouring down his face. The people are filling the altars. He may not have preached with a lot of sound, but the intensity and the, and the quality of the message, the, the essence of what happened in the service, the carrying of the presence of God, nothing was amiss. Everything was right. I never saw him any time where there wasn't a powerful move of God every time he spoke. How? How does someone sustain a lifetime of that kind of intensity? How do you do that? It is managing this thing we call passion. Understanding what passion is. What is your passion? Your passion is directly tied to what you are called to do, what you are wired to do, what you were made to do. And it is directly connected to your sense of the will of God in your life. So if you want to really have that long-term sustainable fruitfulness and excellence, it's because you genuinely have a passion for what you do. 
I worship not because the music is great. I love it when the music is great. Sometimes it's easier to worship when the music is great, but I've worshiped when the music was bad. I traveled, I was in places that the sound system was pretty bad. I mean, they were a small church that were just trying to make it happen. And maybe it was the pastor's 12 year old son that was on the drums and he was doing the best he could do. And some of the times he was on beat and some of the times he wasn't, but you know what? Everybody in that room loved Jesus and they were singing with all they had. And you know what I did? I danced and I worshiped and I praised God, not because the music was awesome, but because I was in a holy place and I love Jesus and I have a passion to worship God. And sometimes I do it when I don't feel anything and it becomes a sacrifice of praise. But I find the fire falls every time I do it in spite of how I feel. I have a passion for the presence of God. I love being with Jesus. How can I produce what I produce? How do I preach as many times as I preach? I've preached 300 times in a year. That's like six times a week. How do you do that? People used to ask me, how do you travel all over the world when I was an evangelist? How do you do it? I said, God gives you grace for what's his will. I got excited every time it was a new city, it's a new opportunity. Every time I had a chance to get behind a pulpit, there was someone's life that I could, that could be changed, that could potentially be transformed in this service. God's power and grace and glory could come into this place and I, and I get to be his representative right now. I get to. And so I, I wanna be a, an effective preacher. So I'm passionate about study. I'm passionate about reading the word of God. I'm passionate about learning. I'm passionate about staying connected. I'm passionate about hearing God's voice. And those passions create pathways. Passion creates pathways. Whatever you give your passion to, whatever you give your heart to, will create neural pathways in your brain. You can literally start a new skill, learn a new skill at any age, and your brain will adjust with a new neural pathway. Learning a language, learning how to ride a bike, play an instrument, they say it gets harder with time, but it doesn't mean you cannot do it. Neural pathways can be created. What it means is that the more you consistently do something, the more your brain changes how it's wired to give you the energy that you need for whatever that is. Let me give you two practical examples. And then we'll pertain this, we'll connect this to uh, the spirit. And then I'm gonna read a verse to you and then we're gonna close. Let me give you two practical examples. So I'm not sure who you would, who this would be. Maybe it was pediatricians or maybe it was neuroscientists, but they were studying development of the brain um, from adolescence through the teenage years um, into adulthood. And they said that they were astonished at 16, half of the brain shut down. And everyone's out there going, oh, that explains it. And I understand what's wrong with my teenager. They just turned 16 and man, they've lost half their intelligence. No, 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 that's not what it meant. That's not what it meant. Half their brain shut down. What it means is that up to 16, the pathways are still monitoring our patterns of life, our habits, what we do the most. So they say you might try three or four instruments up to age 16, but then there's one that you really like the most, clarinet. And so it'll cut out the part of the brain that knows drums, the part of the brain that knows piano. It just kind of drops that off and it puts all of its energy towards clarinet. And so what actually happens is at 16, you start getting much more refined. Your skills get refined. Your Thought processes get more refined. They get more set. Uh, football players get better at their position. Basketball players get better, you know, uh, at their position. Baseball players get better at their position. Uh, musicians get better at their instruments. Language skills, whatever, it, because your brain says, whatever you do the most, whatever you're spending the most time, that's where I'm going to wire you. So they say it shuts down because they're saying, I want to divert the energy from things that are not producing as much to the things that seem to give the most value. It needs to be the most joy seems to come from these. So the brain, it adapts. So now if you want to expand back out, you have to be very intentional from that point on. 
the time you get to 21, whatever your personality is, is set. Unless you have an emotionally uh, 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 tragic event or significant, they say emotionally significant event happens, and then you can change uh, personality, etc., cetera, uh, past age 21. But this is a little bit about how God made us. So the second, the second example would be how our body responds to stress is another example. Urgent versus passion. Passion is something that is an internal motivation that says, I have value in what I do. I have value in who I am. And so I'm going to stay with these passions. I'm going to stay with these things. These are things that matter. They're important to me. This is what gets me up in the morning. You have to identify those things and you have to know what God made you. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. The original Hebrew says in the way that they are bent or in the way that God has already wired them. Train them up in the way he should go in the way that they're wired. You'll start seeing what they are and then you feed that. You put more, more emphasis on the way that they are wired. This is what God is saying to us with our passions, with our focus. You start with a lot of things and then you hone down. I volunteer for everything, go to everything, but then there's certain things that as I do them, wow, that's what I'm really passionate about. Okay, I shut down some of these other areas so I can be better at this. Make sense? This is how we do with our spiritual life, how we do with our ministries. This is how we have that long-term sustained energy. So stress, they did a study with Boeing and Lockheed Martin. There was a huge government contract, I wanna say it was like $250 million in which new fighter planes were going to be built and some other uh, weapons. And both of these companies um, had contracts with the government and both of them provided similar um, similar things, whether it was helicopters or tanks or whatever it was, but they are both, especially in the airplane uh, business, they fighter jets, they both made fighter jets. So they had two teams that were working, one for Lockheed Martin and one from Boeing. And they were both the sales teams that were going to be meeting with the congressmen and the people on those committees and meeting with the generals and, uh, you know, and going to the Pentagon. Because once this thing was awarded, it was going to be a contract that lasted maybe you know, five years. And it would be all this money that would come into this company. So these sales teams were pit against each other. So they decided, the, the, the psychologists decided to use them as a case study for stress. This was a, a year plus process of making these presentations before the contract would be awarded. It was not going to be split. One of you is going to get it, get it. One of you is not. So what they found is the immense amount of stress from the higher up saying to the sales team, you've got to get this contract. We're counting on you. You know, you're going to get bonuses for this. You're going to be, you know, celebrated. You'll be a hero, but you have to win this contract. If you don't, this is what's going to happen. People might get laid off. I mean, we, we won't be able to do some of our other initiatives. There'll be other issues. Um, and you are the team. You are the responsible. It's either a big win or it's a massive loss. So they felt this mounting stress. So Lockheed Martin won. And when they tested their, uh, their brains and they tested their response to stress, they found in the future that their body actually extended its capacity for stress. They could handle more stress in the future easier because it was an extremely stressful environment for them, but they won. And so there was a release in their brain of all of these chemicals, the dopamine and all of that, that gives you a good feeling about yourself when you have invested a lot of energy, this is the reward. So it's the reward center of the brain releases all of these explosions and man, did they feel good. Wow, it was worth it. Everything that we've been through, it's been, it's worth it. 
because we won. So their body literally adjusted and their brains literally adjusted and said, oh, it's fine. Stress is good because the end result was good. So the body literally became better at handling stress. Now, guess what happened to the Boeing people? You're right. The Boeing people had less ability for stress. They had less capacity. They broke down sooner. Many of them uh, went worked with other companies. They felt like failures. They uh, never again will I be in that kind of an in environment. It was just too much. It was too stressful. And their bodies and their brains literally uh, broke down and said the stress was not worth the effort because we did not get the reward that we wanted. The same thing can happen in ministry. The same thing that can happen in your personal life is that you invest, you invest, you invest, you hope, you hope, you hope, and then the thing that you wanted didn't happen. So this is where you lose some of your passion because virtue was diverted and you have to figure out what happened. You have to figure out why that was not successful. Think about Mark 9, one of our classic texts. And this is the next book in the series, Transformational Warfare. Visitation, transformation, multiplication. Next book we're working on. I will be going back to this text and doing a lot of uh, writing about this. When they couldn't cast the devil out, the disciples said, what's wrong with us? How come we couldn't cast the devil out? They felt like failures. And Jesus just had to adjust their thinking and reset them so that they could re-up their passion and renew their focus. This was because of your unbelief. This kind goes not out, but by prayer and fasting. There was a, there was a faith barrier here. And the only way you get past this faith barrier, break through that unbelief, is through fasting and prayer. So I want to just encourage somebody here today that there are some urgent things that you're going to have to manage, but your whole life is not going to be urgent and you can't live on that level of operating in a crisis at all times. You can't. You have to readjust yourself. People that work in the um, ER, they have a total disposition. People that are in battle zones, uh, they have to have a di totally disposition and they learn to manage the stress because they've seen a positive outcome. Somebody came in with a heart problem about to die. We stabilized them. We did our job. So their stress responses are going to be different. You and I that operate in ministry or pray for people or are, are in a lot of spiritual warfare, that can be very stressful. But every time you win, every time you overcome, there's something that just settles in on you and you get more and more peace. And what happens is that your peace becomes your power and it's less energy exerted with same results or sometimes even more results. So I'm going to pray with you today from James chapter four and verse number 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you've committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So this is all talking about getting healed, being whole, praying with one another, confessing where you are, uh, speaking with the prayer of faith, and then having effectual, fervent, that means sustained prayer of being in the right position, a righteous man. This avails much. It produces a lot. And he goes straight into that of talking about passion. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth for the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again earnestly, we could put in the margin, and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. So I want to speak to someone here today that we have to direct our passions in prayer. And as we do, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The more success you have in prayer, the more you want to pray. The more effective you are in prayer, the more passionate you are going to be in prayer. So we have to dissect the book of James, look through the book of James. It's all about effective lifestyle, effective ministry, effective prayer. 
you have not because you asked not you ask and have not because you asked amiss that you may heap it on your own lusts your passion was in the wrong place he closes out james by saying the effectual fervent prayer it will work if your passions are managed in the right way father we ask you in the name of jesus to help us to have that sustained passion and compassion that constantly renewed energy towards fulfilling your will and the excitement of seeing prayers answered, the excitement of seeing lives changed, the excitement of souls coming into the kingdom, the excitement of feeling that uh, you are with us, that your favor is upon us, the knowing and the joy of really being, oh God, in the glory of God. We thank you for it, Lord, today. I know this was a little bit different, a bit different session today than what we have done at other times, but I just wanted to give some encouragement to you of wherever you are, whatever's going on in your life. Let God restore you, renew you, revitalize you, lift the burdens off you, keep in the center of Jesus. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength and let your passion for God and for his people and for his work, let it burn strong. And let's see the kingdom of God come. Let's see the world changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk to you again real soon. We love you and God bless.